What's up, everyone? Welcome back to Mom's Basement MMA. And in this episode, I'm going to preview and predict UFC Fight Night Prez vs. Tyra that will be taking place real soon. Thank you guys for checking out this video. Thank you for being a part of the community. All right, guys, let's get into the very first fight. It is scheduled for middleweight when Ikram Alaskirov goes up against Antonio Tricoli. Ikram Alaskirov, we don't see this guy set foot in the cage very often, but it's not entirely his fault. He's victim to a lot of bout cancellations, a lot of pullouts, and a lot of people probably do not want to fight this guy. You may recall back in on the Anaheim pay-per-view uh, when Volk fought Tuporia, he was supposed to fight Fluffy Hernandez there. That fight ended up not panning out, and we've just kind of been at a standstill with him, but there's an opportunity for him to take a short-notice fight, so he uh, leaps at the uh, chance to fight Antonio Tricoli. The one thing I will say about Ikram Oskirov is the in the limited amount of time that we have seen him, he has looked very impressive. 15 and 1 record. He has a win over Warley Alves, a win over Phil Haas, a win over Mario Souza. So maybe not the most formidable competition at this point in time, but the UFC is trying to build him up and um Hopefully we see him get a big fight soon. He'll be going up against Antonio Tricoli. I've already talked about Tricoli. Tricoli, as you may recall, uh, I question how he's even in the promotion. Well, I don't question how he's in the promotion. Uh, Mackenzie Dern cashed in a favor in order to get him here. He has done absolutely nothing to warrant being in the UFC at this point in time. He won his fight against Kenneth Berg on Contender a few years ago but that fight ends up getting nullified because he had a PED issue. He's fought exactly one time since, and it was back on the regional scene in Brazil. Now he's 33 years old, a jiu-jitsu guy. That's really kind of the best I have for him at this point in time. Um, this is a fight that I don't think we really need to spend a whole lot of time on. Uh, I Antonio Tricoli is going to have to catch Ikram Alaskirov making a mistake. If Graham Al Alaskirov is going to have to like fall right into an arm bar uh, or, or get caught in like a triangle or, of some sort, Antonio Tricoli, he is a jiu-jitsu guy, but pending Ikram Alaskirov making a colossal mistake, I do not think Antonio Tricoli is going to win this fight. I'm going to go with Ikram Alaskirov by first round knockout. He's a, He seems to be a special fighter. He seems to be a guy that they are looking to build up really soon. And judging by tapology, we see that everyone is on Alice Girov at this point in time. Guys, I do not know if this fight's actually going to happen or not. I have been searching high and low for odds on this fight, and I have yet to find any. But you can expect if this fight actually ends up taking place, if we make it to weigh-ins, I would expect... Ikram Alaskirov to be close to like a minus 700 favorite. He's going to be a colossal favorite. And if you're going to wager on Alaskirov to win this fight, you're going to need to look at uh, your parlay options because as far as uh, putting a straight bet on Alaskirov, it's probably not going to be uh, worth your time financially. So that's something to keep in mind. If you like Alaskirov, you're going to need to uh, likely part. You're going to need to parlay him to make this uh, worth your while. Okay, let's move on to the featherweight division where Shailen Nurdin Biecki goes up against Melk Costa. I absolutely nailed Shailen's name. Uh, this is an interesting one because you have two guys, Melk Costa. I know him from LFA a little bit, and I had high expectations from him. Now, granted, when he made his UFC debut, it was on short notice. It was against... Tiago Moises right here a year ago that was in Brazil. I thought it was going to be a competitive fight, even though it was against Tiago Moises. I was like, yeah, I like this Melk Costa guy. Even as a dog, he might look pretty good. That didn't end up happening. In fact, he ended up getting choked out by Tiago Moises. Okay, whatever. It is Moises. He's been around for a long time. High-level fighter. And then he follows that up. He does his job. He gets a fight against uh, Austin Lingo that he comes out on the right side of. He gets his first UFC victory. And then he falls short against Steve Garcia. Trading wins and losses at this point. But if we're going to say anything about Mel Melk Costa, maybe a little difficult to write him off. I mean, considering it, it is Steve Garcia, Steve Garcia has looked very impressive thus far. And then you lose your UFC debut versus Tiago Moises. 
maybe it's not the biggest deal, but nonetheless, I did kind of maybe expect a little bit more from Milk Costa having watched him compete in LFA for a uh, few fights, but not really um, living up to the billing thus far. He goes up against Shailen Nerd and Biecki, and he has one of the craziest resumes that I have seen uh, thus far. I mean, it's padded beyond belief. 19 knockouts, 10 submissions. Uh, but that aside, he is 3-2 and two in the UFC. He was supposed to fight Hyder Emile in his most recent fight. That ends up not pulling out. That ends up not panning out. He ends up pulling. There's the loss against Steve Garcia in his most recent fight. Now, he was the minus 185 betting favorite going into that one. He blasts Steve Garcia early in the fight, nearly knocks him out. They get in a grappling exchange. He does maintain top control. He looked good. But in the waning moments of that first round, he started to gas. And we saw Garcia tag him. And in the second, he gets tagged by Garcia again. He gets uppercutted to the body. Fight ends. Mel Costa, he fought Steve Garcia also. So there is a shared opponent in, com in, in, in common with these two. And he was the minus 270 betting favor going into that fight. He immediately tries to grapple Garcia, which is smart which is smart. That is something that he should do given Costa's skill set. But for five minutes, he's trying to grapple Steve Garcia, get him down to the ground, use his jujitsu, kind of get him out of there with the submission. We saw those attempts ultimately uh, not work out. I mean, the first round was just a complete wash. You saw Costa just li literally just try to grapple fuck him the entire time with, to no avail. And then the, early in the second... We saw Mel Costa just get absolutely melted by Garcia's right, cuts him badly with elbows, and then eventually finishes him. So it was a complete mauling by Steve Garcia. Once Steve Garcia got going in the uh, second round, uh, he got Mel Costa out of there pretty quickly. I do think Mel Costa probably has the grappling advantage, um, but on the feet, I think there may be there might be a little something to be desired for Shai Len. Okay, you lose against Steve Garcia, but he did look good in flashes. I mean, he nearly won this fight in the first round. Prior to that, he beats up on Derek Minner and then a decision victory over TJ Brown. And then another win over Sean Soriano going a couple years back. You know, I'm looking at this one and I can get Shailen Nerd and Biecki at nearly plus 200. I think there's terrific value in there. I do think Melk Costa is probably the higher ceiling guy. Granted, it, he is going up against tough competition, and this is arguably his uh, easiest fight of his career thus far. But a lot of question marks about Melk Costa. I don't know how you can look at this fight and be minus 210 confident. So I'm going to take the dog in Nerd Mbieke. I think there's a ton of value there. Uh, we, we, we've seen, aside from the Garcia fight, we've seen him do okay against a decent ish competition we'll say Derek Minner of course he's no longer in the promotion TJ Brown's no longer in the promotion San Soriano he's not in the promotion so maybe I'm on crack I probably shouldn't have said that but in any event we do have uh, a body of work um, for Shia Leonard and Biecki I think there's some value here I'm gonna look for him to get this one done by decision I think there's a uh, I think it's a good numbers play uh, minus 210 for Mel Costa. There's just no way I can do that. He's going to need to show me that he can do a little bit more at this level of competition beyond just trying to grapple fuck people. I think he's going to have a hard time doing that against Shailen, and I think Shailen might end up catching him. That is something that I'm kind of looking at, but I'm just going to go uh, Nerd and Biecki by decision. He might give up a tough round. In fact, Costa might end up uh, just completely trying to grapple fuck uh, in the very first round of the fight. The first round might be a snoozer. Costa might be able to get him down and win the first round. But as this fight ends up progressing, expect Costa to gas and let's look for Nerd and Biecki to take advantage of that. I'll just say he outpoints him. No knockout finish for me, but I like Shailen uh, by going the distance by decision. And for these odds near plus 200, I think there's terrific value there. I don't see a huge difference between these two at this point in time. Costa, like I said, is he probably the better prospect? Yeah, probably. But I'm going to go ahead and roll the dice with Nerd and Biecki at almost plus 200. I think there's, I think that's a terrific value play. Okay, let's move on to the card. This time we're in the flyweight division. We're tier gear 
Ulan Bekov will be going up against Joshua Van. Joshua Van is a guy that uh, really ha- impresses the hell out of me. He is from the Fury FC circuit, and he's been nothing short of fantastic in his UFC career thus far. He's only 22 years old. Look at this. A win over the former LFA champion, Felipe Bunez, in his last fight looked great. Uh, another win over Kevin Borjas, and then a win over Zalgas Jumagulov. So well, thus far, this kid has been uh, every much meeting and exceeding all expectations put up in front of him, but he has his toughest fight to date when he goes up against Tagir Ulenbekov. Tagir is 15 and 2, 32 years old. We last saw him fight Cody Durden, and he ended up choking him out. That was a few months back, and then prior to that, he ends up beating Nate Manus. Joshua Van is currently a plus 170 betting underdog at this point, and then uh, Tagir, of course, is the betting favorite at minus 205. Now, Tagir was supposed to fight Alex Perez, who was the number fifth ranked flyweight, and now uh, he th- there's a change, and now we see him fighting Joshua Van. And that's kind of a tough sell if you're on Tagir's side because you look at it and it's like, well, what exactly does Tagir Ulenbekov get for beating Joshua Van? You go from fighting like a ranked guy, a guy at the like upper end of the flyweight rankings to an unranked prospect. Kind of a tough sell for Tagir Ulenbekov, quite honestly. Uh, I wanted to talk briefly on that fight against Cody Durden. Cody Durden, we all know kind of what he's about, a gifted wrestler. 66% 66% takedown defense for Durden, by the way. And there's a check hook that sits Durden down early in the first. We saw Durden get close to getting gillied late in the first. Tagir almost rear naked, rear naked chokes him too, but he's saved by the bell. And then the second, we saw Tagir backpack Durden. Chris Tyone could have taken a point from Tagir for putting his feet in the fence continually. In any event, he ends up getting the uh submission but it is kind of a bullshit win like quite honestly uh how many more warnings was Tagir gonna get like i would have been i i I would have thought to myself like you know what at least take the point away from the guy you're gonna let you're gonna let him maintain that position even though you've like repeatedly told him get your freaking foot out of the fence and you know chris tyone didn't do anything so i thought that uh victory over Durden, how how he was able to get that win, the way in which he did, I thought that was kind of bullshit. I thought he should have uh, gotten a point taken away, and he should have lost the position. And, you know, who knows what could have happened. But in any event, it is what it is. Tagir ends up getting somewhat of a cheese win, even though he did dominate, you know, kind of an unfortunate uh, way to lose if you're Cody Durden. But, you know, it is what it is. Joshua Van versus Tagir Ulenbekov. I don't hate the idea of making a dog play on Van in this one. And in fact, you see a lot of people on Tapology going in that direction because this kid does look like the real deal. I mean, he is in your face, a gifted striker. He looks really good. But I am going to go the other way. I'm going with the betting favorite, minus 205. I like Tagir by submission in this one. I say he actually gets this one done in the third round. I think Joshua Van is special, though. He's a special guy. I do think we're going to see him in the rankings in short order. But to me, I think Tagir is maybe a little bit too much too soon. Keep in mind, like Joshua Van is barely drinking age in the United States. He's 22 years old, and he's fighting Tagir Ulenbekov, a highly gifted fighter who is in his athletic prime right now. And I think Joshua Van is, is uh, very impressive. I like him a lot. Um, I don't, again, I don't hate the uh, idea of a dog pick on Joshua Van, but I'm going the other way, guys. I'm going with Ulan Bekov by decision. I think Ulan Bekov's takedowns. I think he's going to be able to figure out a way to get Joshua Van taken down. I think uh, Joshua Van is going to look good initially, But I I do believe that Tagir ultimately is going to end up taking him down. And then I think he will ultimately find a submission victory in this fight. We move on up the card to the featherweight division where Jekka Sarji goes up against Weston Wilson. He comes from a Wushu background. He has trained in the past in San Diego. And when I did my research on him, I noticed that he got some training in with a lot of up and coming prospects that compete with cage warriors. So I did find that to be interesting about him he has been to decision only one time in 17 pro mma fights which is very impressive 
in his most recent fight, he went up against Lucas Alexander. He was the plus 400 betting underdog. And this was supposed to be a layup for Alexander, who was the minus 500 betting favorite. And Alexander came into that fight heavy too. So the deck was really stacked against Jekka Saraji for all intents and purposes. Initially, Alexander starts looking good, low kicks. He cracks Saraji a couple of different times. But this fight ends in a really bizarre way. We saw Alexander's kick get caught. We saw Sergi dump him to the canvas. He scrambles up to his feet, and Sergi unloads a right hook, and it lands clean on Alexander, and it, and, and it ends the fight. So you kind of look at it, and you're just like, man, MMA is just so freaking unpredictable. Uh, was that a bona fide finish, or was it kind of a fluke? Were the odds appropriate for that fight? Yeah, they probably were, but MMA is crazy. Anything can happen. Just kind of an unlucky way to lose a fight if you're Lucas Alexander. This time, he'll be going up against Weston Wilson. Weston Wilson is an upstate karate guy who happens to have an arsenal of submissions to his name, but he's a uh, killer-be-killed fighter. You either get caught in a submission by Weston Wilson or you end up knocking him out. You can't help but kind of feel for him because basically he's been brought in to job against high-level competition. And quite honestly, like this is his first realistic fight that he could potentially win. Because you put up Jekka Saraji against Joe Anderson Brito, you put up Saraji against John Silva... He's losing those fights just like Wilson is. And, you know, we look at this. Don't forget, Saraji, he ends up getting knocked out by Anshul Jubilee not that long ago. And you look at that road to UFC competition and some of his other competition prior to that. Is this guy really a minus 350 betting favorite? You're minus 350 confident in this guy? After kind of a weird knockout win against Lucas Alexander in a fight in which he was probably on his way toward losing, it's tough for me to put money on this fight. Do I think Saraji wins? Yes. Yes, I do. But minus 350, that to me seems crazy. I can't do Weston Wilson because I just simply don't think, aside from this suicide run that he's been on against Brito and then Silva, it fights in which he's had Really no real chance of winning. I hate to say it like that, but let's just call it for what it is. I have concerns about the state of his chin. It, to me, would seem like they're trying to set up and maybe push Sarji a little bit. I say Sarji gets this one done. I say he'll uh, knock out Weston Wilson, but I'll, I'll give Weston Wilson the benefit of the doubt. I'll say Weston Wilson lasts the first round, but then he'll get caught in the second, and then Sarji will end up winning the fight. There's a reason why they're giving Sarji... Weston Wilson. Whilst Weston Wilson is arguably the runt of the litter in this weight class, all accounts, this should be a fight that Jack Asaraji should be able to win, but we'll end up seeing Weston Wilson at even plus 275. I think that's way too low. I think if you're going to lean dog in this one, I think if you want to gamble and maybe put a little bit on Weston Wilson, you need to wait until fight day. Because you could probably end up getting him at uh, pl in the plus 300 range. I'm pretty confident in saying that. For now, I would say for most people, I think this is a fight that I think this is a dogger pass fight. And I will not be betting minus 350 on Jekka Saraji. I'm sorry, guys. I'm just not doing it. I am not going to risk getting burned here. But I can't do Weston Wilson at this number either. I, I, I'll just say Sarji ends up finishing him in the second round, but a fight that I'm going to avoid. Okay, we move up to the women's starweight division where Julia Polis Polastri goes up against Josephine Knudsen. Polastri is the plus 190 betting underdog, and then the betting favorite Knudsen is minus 240. Her last fight was on the Contender Series where she fought Patricia Alugis, Alujas. Not sure uh, how to say that name. Um, and then she's had two fight cancellations due to both of her opponents dropping out. So we have not seen her compete in a few months, but uh, not necessarily her fault. They just, she's had bad luck in the uh, scheduling department. So we'll see what ends up happening. But the UFC likes her. 
They put her up against Alujas, and she was the minus 600 betting favorite. And by all accounts, it was like a textbook setup fight. I think the UFC uh, liked what they saw when they watched her compete against Jasmine Jazz DeVicious on Contender Series back in 2021. So they asked her to come back on the show. Easy win against a crusher from Paraguay. I hate to say it, but I mean, it is what it is. Her opponent had a, a pretty record. But you dig, you do some digging on Patricia Alujas, and you can kind of figure out in relative short order that she fought absolutely nobody, and her record was padded beyond belief. And the UFC knew that Pilastri was going to win that fight, and she ended up uh, doing exactly that. She goes up against Josephine Knudsen, who is a Swedish fighter. She trains out of one of the most prestigious gyms in Sweden, and that is All Stars Training Center. An undefeated fighter. She's competed in FCR, Road to UFC, UAE Warriors, and she has won every single one of those contests to date. She's looked really impressive, too. In her uh, most recent fight, she went up against Marnik Mann, and she was the minus 700 betting favorite going into that fight. One-way traffic, and you could almost make an argument that she 10 aided Marnik Mann in every single round of the fight. At the very least, you could say it was a 30-25. You know, I look at Knudsen. She did look really good against Marnik Mann. And then prior to that, she fights Isis Verbeek. And we saw her get a uh, decision nod over Jacinta Austin, who is an Australian fighter who is uh, actually very good. That's probably her most impressive victory uh, to date, the uh, Austin fight. For Pilastri, like I mentioned before, it was that fight against a Paraguayan can crusher that she uh, made it to the promotion on. And then after she lost to Jasmine on Contender, we see her go back to the regional MMA scene and fight some decent-ish competition. We have to kind of keep, keep in mind, we're talking about females and we're talking about the regional MMA scene. So you kind of get what you get there. A 19-8 and eight opponent, not the best. A 7-11 and 11 opponent, again, not the best. And then uh, she fights an undefeated gal in Brenda Gotig, who is 6 and 0. So, you know, I'm looking at this one and Pilastri plus 190, and then Knutson is minus 240. Everyone is on Knutson right now, and I understand why she looked fantastic in her most recent fight against Marnik Mann, but I don't like the odds for her. Minus 250 for Knutson, I think, is way too high. Keep in mind, Marnik Mann is a jiu jitsu fighter with limited striking. And a lot of people at this level of competition are going to look really good against her if this fight stays on the feet. And that's exactly what ended up happening. And Julia Palastri is a lot better than Marnik Mann, in my opinion. And I'm looking at this. The size is roughly the same. She's got a little bit of a reach. I've liked some things of what I've seen from her. I think this fight's going to end up being a lot closer than what people are giving it credit for. And if I can get Pilastri at plus 200, I don't mind that at all. Um, I don't see a huge difference between these two, quite honestly. They both can crack on the feet. They both have decent wrestling. They both have decent grappling as well. I think we're looking at a 50-50 fight here, quite honestly. You style on Marnik Man, I don't care. And then you style on a Paraguayan jobber, I don't care. Uh, I think on paper, this fight's going to be a lot closer than what people are giving it credit to, for. I think Knutson should be the betting favorite based off of her prior level of competition, but I don't mind taking a chance on Pilastri. I'm going to take a, I'm going to take the dog here at near, at a near plus 200. Nobody's giving her credit whatsoever. I think people are, I think people are overestimating how good Knutson is based off of that last fight against Marnik Mann. And I think people have just forgotten about this fight against Alujas um, not that long ago. Keep him, like Remember, guys, the UFC likes her. They gave her another opportunity to be back on contender after she fell short against Jasmine Jazz DeVicious. So let's see what happens. I'm going to take a gamble in on the Brazilian here. I'm going to look for her to get this one done by decision at near plus 200. I like that number. It's a total uh, numbers play for me, so I'm going to take a chance on her to get it done. Okay. Let's move on to the flyweight division where Carly Judas will be going up against Gabriela Fernandez. Carly Judas is the plus 210 betting underdog and then the and then Fernandez, the Brazilian is the minus 260 betting favorite. Fernandez trains out of MMA Masters. She is the former interim LFA flyweight champion and she made her UFC debut against Jasmine Jazdevicious. 
In her most recent fight, she went up against Teresa Baleda, who was a six and one fighter, and she ended up losing that contest. She goes up against Carly Judas. Judas fought Ernesta Carascata on Dana White Contender Series uh, a few months back, and it was an epic fight. And she ends up losing by split decision, but it was such a good fight. The UFC liked what they saw. They decided to uh, give her an opportunity to uh, come back. The one thing about Carly Judas is she's tall. She is a striker, and I'm expecting this fight to happen predominantly on the feet. Gabby Fernandez, it, it's she has been on a tough roll, but her two losses are against grapplers, Jasmine Jazz DeVicious and Teresa Bleda. This lady throws with a ton of power. Off the feet, she can crack. And this is a preferential matchup for her stylistically because she does not have to worry about getting taken down. It's okay to fade Fernandez against grapplers, right? I mean, that much is obvious. You lose against Blada, and then you lose against Jazz DeVicious. We, we see a track record, right? A deficiency against grapplers. Judas is not a grappler. Judas is a striker. And I think you're going to see Fernandez really take advantage of this matchup stylistically. She's got more power. I don't know if she's the faster of the two, but I know for a fact she is the more powerful striker, and she's got way more experience as well. Minus 260 is a little steep, but I'm going to go with the Brazilian in this one. I say she gets this one done by decision, but I don't expect this fight to be really close. I think she's going to cruise and win comfortably. Again, it's that power differential. Maybe she even gets a knockout here. Uh, but I'm not going to bet on that. I'll just say she gets this one done by decision. As long as she can keep this fight on the feet, I think she's going to do okay, and I do think she's going to cruise to a comfortable decision. Uh, Gabby Fernandez, just watch her perform. Watch how good she's going to look. Watch her power shine through in this fight. I think she's going to be a lot more aggressive. I think she's going to use a wide array of kicks. I think she's going to be able to fight unchained a little bit, right? not worry so much about having to get taken down against somebody like Carly Judas. So I really think uh, stylistically she's going to be given an opportunity to uh, shine and look really good in this matchup. So I'm going to look for big things for Gabby Fernandez. I'll be looking for her to get this one done by decision. Okay, we move up the card where Adam Fugit will be going up against Josh Quinlan. Adam Fugit is a guy that I first heard about back in 2022. He fought Solomon Renfro, which is a fighter that I'm familiar with. And the fight happened back here in LFA. And if you watch LFA, they're pretty good with the matchups. But also, you know, keep in mind, it's a regional promotion and they know what they're doing. And they brought in Fugit to job for Solomon Renfro. This fight was happening in Niagara Falls. And if you aren't familiar with Solomon, he is a guy from Buffalo. He's from Western New York, and he had just come off of uh, a loss on Contender. And the idea was bring in Fugit, set up Solomon, get him a knockout, and then everyone goes home happy. Well, the plan backfired in that fight, and Fugit ends up starching Solomon Renfro, quiets the crowd. Like... Absolutely shocks everybody, quiets the crowd. And that's kind of one thing about Adam Fugit that I don't think people talk about enough is his stopping power. He's he's got a nine and four record, but go back, look at how he ends up winning fights, and you will see that he does have a track record of getting finishes. Knockout, there's that TKO knockout against Kinoshita. Again, we just talked about that knockout against Solomon and then the knockout against uh, uh some random jobber I've never heard of. In his most recent fight, he went up against Mike Mallett, and he was the uh, plus-180 betting underdog going into that fight. He got cracked early by Ma Mike Mallott. And what was interesting about this one was Fugit was in center control. Despite being a long, lengthy guy, he wants to be in the center of the cage. He was the aggressor in this fight. And I was just mildly surprised at that approach. Sometimes you see guys with this sort of body type, with that reach, and they want their opponents to come to them. That wasn't the case against Mike Malott. I was a, a little curious uh, at that approach. And we saw Mike Malott crack 
Adam Fugit repeatedly over the course of this fight. And early in the second, Mike Malott nails Fugit with a right hook, and he pounces on Adam Fugit and gillies him and uh, gets the victory. So it was an impressive showing for Mike Malott. But the one thing about Adam Fugit that I'll say is he's tricky. And I do think that people sleep on this guy a lot. Um, I don't think his power is really uh, respected. And he is a uh, gifted striker. I'll, I'll give him that much. He goes up against Josh Quinlan. Josh Quinlan is 6-2. and two, And for him, it's another nightmare matchup. Like, the UFC is intent on giving Josh Quinlan the tallest, rangiest guys every time he goes up and he fights. In his first fight, he went up against Trey Waters. And then in his most recent fight, he went up against another tall, rangy guy in Danny Barlow. Trey Waters ended up cruising to a decision. He could not get on the inside, and Trey Waters just outpointed him for 15 minutes. And then against Danny Barlow. The first round was competitive, but I did think Barlow did enough to take the round. Throughout the fight, the one thing that I would say is he looked better off of his back foot letting Barlow come to him and counter him. But he has to move forward a lot because he doesn't have a reach. And when he moves forward, this guy gets tagged a lot. And you see that like time and time again. Go back, watch that Danny Barlow footage, and you'll see he goes forward, and Barlow just makes him pay a price for it every single time. And then in the third round, Barlow just chins Quinlan three times and puts him out on his feet. And keep in mind, guys, like that fight was 90 days ago, roughly. And now he's back in action fighting Adam Fugit after just getting knocked out. Well, it was a standing knockout. Let, let's be clear. It was a standing knockout. But nonetheless, it's tough for me because that fight just happened. And now he's back in the cage. And when people get knocked out like that, I want to see you away for six months minimum. So I, I'm questioning the move here. I think Josh Quinlan is taking a big risk going into this fight. He better crack Adam Fugit. And because if he doesn't, if this fight ends up going past the first round, I think he's going to get hit. And it might take a while. It may take Adam Fugit a little while to chop him down with that striking. But I do believe that Josh Quinlan, I don't think his chin is anywhere near 100%. Adam Fugit does have stopping power. And in fact, that's exactly uh, what I think is going to happen. I think Quinlan is fighting compromised. I think he's desperate for a win. I think it's silly for him to be jumping in the cage after just getting finished three months ago. And Fugit, we haven't seen him fight in almost a year. Give me Fugit. Give me the guy who's been away for a little while against a guy that's gotten knocked out in his most recent fight only a few months back, uh, who took a shitload of punishment. And there's no way, there's just no way anyone's going to convince me he's 100% and he's ready to go. Give me Fugit, who is rested and, and healthy. I'll take the healthy guy over the not so healthy guy with a chin that might be compromised going into this fight. I think it's going to make a difference. I think you're, we're going to see Fugit knock him out late in the third round. And we can get him at minus 115. I think that's a bargain. I don't know how you can pick Josh Quinlan at minus 105 going into this fight when he just got starched not that long ago. He's compromised. He's not going to be healthy. Give me the healthy fighter. I'll take Adam Fugit in this fight. Uh, Skill-wise, they're probably close to the same. But I like the reach. I like the 77-inch reach for Fugit. I think Quinlan is going to get tagged as he's marching forward. I don't think his chin is anywhere near where it ought to be. I think Fugit's going to find it repeatedly over the course of this fight and ultimately get the win. I cannot believe 560 people have predicted this fight and everyone's going on Quinlan uh, to get a knockout. Based off of what? Based off of what? Uh, I think that's absolutely crazy. I like Fugit in this fight. I think he gets a late finish. Okay, we move on to the flyweight division where Nate Manus goes up against Jimmy Flick. I'm a little con I'm a little confused at the placement of this fight, quite honestly. And what I mean by that is they're putting this fight in the apex, and Nate Manus is from Kentucky, and Jared Cannonier 
and company, they're all they all are all literally fighting in Louisville. How come Nate Manus didn't get on that card? Kind of bizarre. In any event, he goes up against Jimmy Flick. Uh, this is a setup fight for Nate Manus, quite honestly. He's 15 and 3, but we saw that he did fight Mateus Mendoza not that long ago, who's a jobber. And, but they know what they're doing. They're trying to make it up for him because he had to fight Tagir, who he lost against. And then he fought uh, Umar, and he lost against him too. So this is another opportunity for Nate Manus to get another win on his record. And he's going up against Jimmy Flick. And Jimmy Flick, to me, is an auto fade. I have not once bet on Jimmy Flick. And maybe the MMA gods are trying to uh, give me a sign Maybe they're telling me to pick Jimmy Flick because as I am going through this breakdown, my black lab just came downstairs. She's licking me right now and she's wagging her tail. And uh, hi, Molly. And um, hang on, I'll show you guys my dog. Here we go. There's my dog. Say hi. In any event, that's a sign from the MMA gods that maybe I should be taking Jimmy Flick. Maybe I should heed these warnings, right? But there's just no way I'm going to do that. An auto fade for me. Jimmy Flick is a one-dimensional jiu-jitsu fighter, submission or bust. I think Nate Manus is going to tag Jimmy Flick and get a knockout. Okay, we move on to the featherweight division where Lucas Almeida will be going up against Timmy Kawamba. Timmy Kawamba, he made his UFC debut on short notice when he went up against Balaji Oki. That fight was contested at lightweight. He is not a lightweight. He is a featherweight fighter. He only fought at 155 pounds because it was short notice. So this is not a new weight class for Timmy Kawamba, and I want to make sure that you guys are aware of that. Um, let's keep it on Kawamba for a little bit. This is a guy that I've been watching fight for a few years now. Uh, he has been a guy that has looked pretty impressive on the regional scene. Prior to the Oki fight, he went up against Michael Stack. Now, Michael Stack, for people who don't know, he is based out of Colorado, and he did contend for the LFA featherweight title a couple years back, and he ended up knocking out Michael Stack in impressive fashion at Tough Enough. That, that was enough to impress the UFC brass and give him a uh, shot at that next level. Prior to that, on contender, he beat Mateo Vogel. It was a uh, snoozer. Um, I don't remember exactly what ended up happening or why they chose not to sign him, but I want to say that fight was uh, a boring fight. I did not go back and watch the tape uh, against Mateo Vogel, but Vogel is a high-level Canadian fighter that he was able to beat. Uh, the, the, the split decision loss against Balaji Oki was absolutely bizarre. I don't know how Kawamba could have won the fight in any of the judges' eyes. And, and this is coming from me, guys. Like, I bet on Kawamba because I know he's a gifted wrestler and Balaji Oki's record is padded beyond freaking belief. He's fought nothing but jobbers, and uh, I don't, I still don't know what to make of him. Quite literally, the only uh, reason why he won that fight, in my opinion, was because his size and physical advantage over Kawamba. We'll see. We'll see how good he looks against somebody who is his size. They have weight classes for a reason. Um, but in any event, tough night at the office for Kwamba. I think if you want to give Kwamba a round, that's fine. I think I was okay giving him the second. But um, Balagioki was the clear winner in that fight. Too big, too strong, uh, and just outmuscled Timmy Kwamba over the course of that fight. He goes up against Lucas Almeida, who's 33 years old. He has one victory in the UFC, but that was back against Mike Trezano a few years ago. He last lost to Pat Sabatini and Andre Feely. The most recent fight was against Andre Feely, but you know this is one that I don't think we can really put too much stock into because Timmy Kwamba is not Andre Feely. He's not going to come out there and just annihilate Lucas Almeida like Andre Feely did. So the fact that Lucas Almeida got sparked by Feely, that doesn't really tell me a whole lot because Timmy Kwamba has more in common with Pat Sabatini than he does Andre Feely. Now, I did not say he's Pat Sabatini, right? I did not say that. I just said he's comparable 
to Pat Sabatini. I don't want to hear any crap in the comments like, oh, Tyler just said Timmy Kwamba is Pat Sabatini. No, I didn't. I'm just saying he's a high-level grappler, a high-level wrestler, just like Pat Sabatini. And I'm saying that because some of you guys go a little nuts in the comment section and take what I say out of context. Stop taking what I say out of context. Uh, between these two, I do think that Timmy Kwamba is going to have success with the takedowns. I do think he's going to figure out a way to get his opponent on the mat and uh, get a lot of control time there. I think that is ultimately where Kwamba wants to take this fight. Let's look for him to strike, level change at a right time, and go for a takedown. If that doesn't work, it wouldn't surprise me if he pressures Almeida, gets him to the fence, and um, they start grappling off the fence, and then Kwamba is able to get a takedown that way. But Kwamba wants this fight down to the ground. I do think he's ultimately going to get it there. Um, I'm not sure he's going to get a submission victory, though. Um, the one thing about him, he's not exactly known for having any sort of uh, success in the submission in the submission department. Oftentimes, he's able to get these fights down to the ground and then get ground and pound finishes. I don't know if I see it happening here. Uh, but I do like Kwamba in this fight. I like Kwamba by decision. I think that's how he uh, ultimately ends up winning this fight. Maybe he loses the first round. Maybe it takes him a little while to get going. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if he starts slow, trying to be cautious and, and, and whatnot, considering uh, the last fight. But let's look for him to uh, be the better fighter and look for him to get it done on fight night. Kwamba by decision is how I'll be playing this fight. Okay, we move on the card to the bantamweight division where Miles Johns will be going up against Douglas Silva D'Andrage. Miles Johns, he returned to the win column in his last fight when he went up against Cody Gibson. He won that fight convincingly, and uh, I was the dummy that picked Cody Gibson when I shouldn't have. Uh, a falling knife for me, right? I looked at it, and I was just kind of like, uh, well... Cody Gibson, you know, he looked good against Brad Katona. He's a big dude, and he might have a uh, significant striking advantage over Miles Johns, but it made absolutely no difference. Um, or that theory basically got blown out of the water immediately. Miles Johns absolutely dominated Cody Gibson, 30-27 across the board. He racked up 6 minutes and 29 seconds of control time. A total route. Not a whole lot more I could say. It was a boring fight, and most of his fights are a little bit boring, in my opinion. But hey, um, who cares? Uh, I mean, money is money. And uh, he absolutely got the job done in that most recent fight against Cody Gibson. He goes up against Douglas Silva D'Andrage, who is the minus 125 betting favorite. And um, I guess I should have said Miles Johns is the plus 100 underdog, but there you go. Douglas Silva D'Andrage, he does put on interesting fights, I suppose. I think that's like he's an entertaining fighter. I'll give him that. Um, he's fighting in his late 30s, but he's still looking solid for the most part. He's won three out of his last four. He uh, fought Cody Stamen in his most recent fight. He picked up a unanimous decision victory, which was sus in my opinion. I think you could definitely make an argument that Cody Stamen won that fight. I talked about that last week. If you want to hear more about my opinion, on that Cody Stamen fight, go to last week's episode. I brought that, I broke that fight down in immense detail there. I'm not about to do it again. Uh, he did lose to Saeed Nur Nurmaga Madov about it, uh, a couple years ago, but you know, not a big deal there. And then uh, Sergey Morozov and then Gatino Perillo are other victories that he has on his resume. He's 38 years old, still looking good, um, but that's rare for somebody in this weight class. Uh, typically you don't see guys fight this late, uh, at the, uh, lower weight classes, but in any event, he got the job done against Cody Stamen. This is an interesting one and it is tricky because we saw Cody Stamen, you know, struggle at times to get Douglas Silva, Dion Draj down to the ground. And Miles Johns is not Cody Stamen in the hands department, in my opinion. But I am looking at this one. The Stamen fight was a year ago, and we saw Miles Johns do relatively well a month ago. And I don't mind taking a chance on Johns at plus money. Uh, plus 100, I can get him currently. He's the younger fighter. And I know what he's going to do. I think we all know what he's going to do. He's going to pressure Silva D'Andrage and look for that takedown. 
like that's 100% what he's going to do. Now, if Johns cannot get the takedown, if he can't wrestle and grapple, he will lose. He is not as good as Douglas Silva, Deion Drage on the feet. I think we all know that, and that is why a lot of people are leaning Silva, Deion Drage in this fight. A lot of people like him by decision and believe in that takedown defense. But I'm going to go with Johns here. I like Johns at uh, underdog money. I think that he is going to be successful in getting this fight down to the ground. And in fact, I think it's going to look somewhat similar to that uh, Cody Gibson fight. He was minus 140 against Cody Gibson. Now we get him at plus 100 going up against a guy that's flirting with his 40s. We'll see what happens, but I'm fading Douglas DeAndrage in this fight. I think Miles Johns uh, is going to figure out a way to take down his opponent and win in boring fashion. Asu Almabayev will be going up against Jose Johnson. I know a little bit about Jose Johnson. He's a journeyman regional MMA fighter. He's tall, he's long, and he's got 36% takedown defense. And best believe it's going to get put to the test in this fight. A six-foot-tall flyweight, which is pretty crazy. Now, he did not always compete at flyweight. On the regional scene, he did compete a lot at 135 pounds so a move down a weight class we saw him win his most recent fight it was against chad and hellinger but what does that tell you like chad and hellinger to me is a jobber i don't think he's any good at all and uh but hey kudos to him because he did win his uh fight against uh lampos grigorio i didn't see that one coming um but maybe that's more of an indictment about how bad lampos is who knows we'll see but you beat a jobber in Chad and, and Hellinger. I don't care. Um, he did lose to DeMond Blackshear prior to that. And then uh, Blackshear is 135 pounds. So uh, we saw him go down to flyweight in that last fight. He goes up against Azu Almabayev, who is the minus 420 betting favorite in this fight. And when I think of like that new class of flyweights that the UFC is trying to push, Taira, Van, Urseg, this guy, Azu Almabayev. This they really like this guy. I do think that you're going to see the UFC really uh, be smart about how they decide to build this guy up. They are giving him like that white glove treatment right now. Nineteen and two record. It does look fantastic. I am a little surprised that they are scraping the bottom of the barrel for this guy and giving him Jose Johnson at this point. We see Joshua Van getting a really tough fight. I kind of expected Azu Almabayev to have a tough one as well. He fought CJ Vergara, who I think beats Jose Johnson pretty easily. And then uh, prior to that, Ode Osborne, he gets a win there as well. So this is actually a huge step down in competition. I think Osborne and CJ Vergara are a lot better than Jose Johnson, quite honestly. I'm not high on Jose Johnson at all. I think he's, I just don't think he's that good. I've seen him fight in the regional scene before, and I'm just not impressed uh, with his overall body of work. He beats Mo Miller, who, you know, he went on contender. He was being kind of built up as like this next big thing, but he flopped. He didn't really pan out. He gets a win over a four and one guy. Uh, he did win on contender, which did shock me. Uh, I'll give him that. I bet on Cartwright, as I think a lot of other people did. And so kudos to him for that. Um, but guys, no reason to get cute here. Alma Baev is going to win this fight. He is going to win this fight. I think he chokes out Jose Johnson in the first round. He's going to get a takedown. This These two are going to grapple. He will get a takedown, and he is going to smoke Jose Johnson on the ground. If you are going to do a parlay, here's one that I already put down. I am parlaying Alma Baev and Manus in this fight. And that's a lot of chalk. I get it, but I am confident that that is going to hit. That is a parlay. That's like a money parlay to me. And it's Captain Obvious. I get it, but uh, I'm not going to get cute. I don't typically parlay. I did last week. I bet Almeida, Strickland, and um, shit. What was the last fight of the? What was the last leg of the parlay, Tyler? What is the last leg of the parlay? Strickland, I'm a. Uh, Almeida, Strickland, and I'm spacing. I'm blanking on the last leg of the parlay. But in any event, 
I hit a three leg parlay. I'm going to do a two legger for this one. Alma Bayev and Manus are going to be on it for me. I like that one a lot. And uh, that's how I'll be playing it. Oh, and it was Islam. It was Islam. Islam was the third leg of the parlay. And I don't know where my head's at. But in any event, guys, I like Alma Bayev to get this one done. He's going to absolutely crush Jose Johnson. I am all over this. You are probably going to need to parlay Alma Bayev if you like him. He's minus 420 right now. Expect him to be closer to minus 600 come actual fight night. Um, yeah, I like him to absolutely smoke Jose Johnson. Okay, we move on up the card to the bantamweight division where Garrett Armfield will be going up against Brady Heastand. Garrett Armfield is the minus 175 betting favorite, and then the comeback on Brady Heastand is plus 150. Brady Heastand fought on Tough 29 back in 2021. He lost his UFC debut to Ricky Tercios. Um, since then, he uh, did beat up on Fernie Garcia, who is a jobber. Good for him. And then he fought Batagrel Dana in his most fight, who's since been released from the promotion, I, I, I believe. Yeah, he is. He's in karate combat now. Beef with Brady Heastand is his record. I mean, it's absolutely padded beyond belief. You beat uh, this guy. I mean, okay, whatever. That's a valid win. I'll give him that. Fernie Garcia is not a good fighter. Uh, he loses to Ricky Tercios. We lose. We beat up on an O and thirteen guy, and then we lose to Chad and Hellinger. Not impressive to me. I don't care about tough twenty nine. Um. So we'll see. We'll see about this kid. I, you know, I I typically fade this kid. I I just I'm not on him yet. And you beat Batagrel Dana. I mean, good for you. I I bet on. Dana or Dana, however you say it. I bet on uh, Dana to win that fight. Uh, unlucky. We'll see. I mean, he is a young guy. I don't mean to shit all over him. He's 25 years old. We'll see. But uh, this is probably a guy that should be fighting on the regional MMA scene. I don't think he should be at this level of competition quite yet. I know a lot of other bantamweights that are just as good, if not better, than Brady Heastan that aren't competing at this level yet. So good for him, I guess. He goes up against Garrett Armfield. Garrett Armfield, it's taken me a while to warm up to this guy. And I don't mean it personally. Like, I like him. I've I've uh, interacted with Garrett a few times. I, he's never been on the show, but I've DM'd him back and forth and vice versa. We we know we have a few people uh, in common that we know. Um, he's a polite guy. I, I really uh, like him personally. And... I got on Garrett because of his uh, work in the regional MMA scene. Like he, I, I, he competed in FAC pr uh, previous to his run in the UFC. And that's kind of how I knew him. I also know that when glory uh, MMA was around, he did some time there. And um, I think it was Don Shanus that told me about Garrett Armfield. Like, Hey, this kid might actually end up being good. Of course, Don Shanus would go on to be the, um, uh, champion at FAC once upon a time. And then he uh, told me like uh, Garrett Armfield is a guy that's uh, worth keeping an eye on. So that's how I ended up uh, following his career. Um, nice kid, but you know, I was always kind of like skeptical of him. Like, okay, well, you know, is he really the real deal or not? Is this guy like ready for this level of competition? We'll see the uh, fight. It was this fight right here against Stephen Graham at FAC where I saw him perform. He went out there, and I was like, okay, well, we'll see. And he absolutely put on a clinic. He smoked Stephen Graham right away. And I was like, okay, cool. We might have something here. He uh, fought David Onama, and he lost by submission. Keep in mind, though, that fight did happen at featherweight. So it's kind of a pass for me. You make your UFC debut. You're going to fight somebody good if it's a short-notice fight. More often than not, that is maybe a little anecdotal. But in any event, he gets a tough fight at featherweight, doesn't go end up going his way, and uh, he moves on to Toshio Kazama. And I looked at this fight and I was like, okay, well, we're going overseas. There, it was that was the on, on that Korean Zombie retirement card, and they brought up Kazama. The fight was in Singapore. Garrett Armfield's like a country kid from Missouri. Like they don't want some kid from Missouri to win a fight against Toshiami Kazuma. He was being fed. He may have been the favorite on paper, but he was being fed. 
I didn't like Armfield at minus 160. That's what the odds were for this fight. He was the minus 160 betting favorite. And um, Kazimov was plus 135. And I just didn't like the numbers for either guy. Um, so I just passed on the fight. I don't remember who I thought was going to win. Um, and I wasn't doing pickums at that point. At least I don't think I was. So I just passed on that fight. But then, uh, hey, full credit to Garrett Armfield. He absolutely blast, blasted Kazuma, got the job done, gets his first victory in the UFC. I really believed, I started believing in him, though, after that Brad Katona performance. Because once again, they tried feeding him to a local guy or a local-ish guy, because Kazuma's Japanese, but Jap Japan, Singapore, whatever. You guys know what I'm trying to say. They tried feeding him to Brad Katona in Canada to get Brad Katona a win, and that plan blew up in their face. I was very impressed by Garrett Armfield. He looked fantastic, and um, I started taking him seriously after this fight. I was like, wow, Garrett, I... Uh, completely underestimated you you look good and in fact we might have something here a gifted striker this guy can stand he can crack um and he out he just dominated brad katona what else can i say his footwork looked great brad katona could not get get all the cylinders firing going up against garrett armfield i like garrett armfield's footwork quite a bit i like his striking that is where he wants to keep these fights on the feet. He's a gifted striker. You better start taking Garrett Armfield seriously. I know I am. Um, you 29, 28, Brad Katona in Canada, you have my attention. In fact, he may have 30, 27 Katona. It's a possibility. And Brady Heastan is not even close to being in the same orbit as Brad Katona. I'm looking for Garrett Armfield to smoke Brady Heastan in this fight. I think he's going to get a knockout in the first round and Garrett Armfield at minus 175. I think that's a great value pick and one that I am going to be all over. I don't think this fight goes the distance. I think Armfield's going to spark Brady. He stand in this fight. We move on to the main event where Alex Perez will be going up against Tatsuro Tayira. Alex Perez is the minus is the plus 150 betting underdog. And then Tatsuro Tayira is the minus 175 betting favorite. Perez is the fifth ranked UFC flyweight contender, and then Tyira is the 13th ranked contender. They were linking Tyira and Joshua Van together. Like these two were supposed to fight. That fight ends up getting dropped off. I was surprised at that matchup. I heard rumors of it, like that fight was going to come together, and then it doesn't materialize. And I was just shocked that they would put two rising prospects like Van and Tyira together if it weren't like for a title eliminator or if it weren't for the actual title. I thought that was bizarre, and I think the UFC did the right thing in making sure that fight did not end up taking place because it didn't make sense to have two rising prospects this early on fight each other. This fight is actually... I was surprised, though, that they would put this fight together. Uh, in a way. In a way, I'm surprised. Because logically, I look at this, Tatsuro Taira, he hasn't been in the promotion that long. He's, do he's doing great. He's choking people out. He's looked fantastic against mid-level competition, but we are going all the way up to one of the highest ranked contenders in that flyweight division. And at this point, like they're trying to fast track this kid is what's happening. And I think it has more to do with the state of the flyweight division than Tyra specifically, because we have to remember Ursa got a title fight. He just showed up. He won two fights and then he basically gets a title fight. Tyra has been around for a year fighting really low level competition and now all of a sudden we're seeing them go full throttle on this guy I, i'm okay with like you know throwing him up against somebody like cody durden or something like that somebody who might be able to test him with the actual wrestling somebody that might be able to actually defend a takedown i feel it's too much too soon and i'm not gonna go into like a comprehensive x's and o's breakdown and analysis of this one i'm going more off of feel and the theme of this year has been you get these guys that they push before they might be ready and it doesn't work out. We saw that with Jack Hermanson and Joe Piper. We saw that with Benoit Sandini and Dustin Poirier. And we saw it with Blanchfield and Manon Firo. And like the theme is the veterans are winning these fights. The UFC knows that 
running out of running low on star power. A lot of our stars are getting ready to move on. They're getting ready to retire. We need to manufacture stars in a hurry. They're fast tracking these guys and it's not working out. And Taira is a gifted fighter. I like this kid a lot. He's showing a, 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 a an elite potential, but all of a sudden, but now all of a sudden he's going to be fighting the fifth ranked guy in Alex Perez, who just sparked Mateus Nicolau on short notice, took no damage whatsoever. We'll see. We'll see what happens. But guys, I, I looked at this fight and as soon as it was announced, uh, I was leaning Perez by decision. Uh, I think that's the right side for this. It's a huge scale up in competition for Tatsiro Taira. And if I can get Alex Perez at plus 150, I'm all over it. I think you should be as well. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to Mom's Basement MMA. My name is Tyler. Let me know in the comments section which fights you think I got wrong. We'll continue our conversation there. Thank you guys so much for being a part of the community. I'll be talking to you all very, very soon.